This session is to talk about new pipeline siting and construction. You know, who's in charge of safety? How well do the siting authorities intersect with the safety authorities? It's a kind of an ongoing um, issue around the country with this boom of new uh, production, which led to a boom in new pipelines of who's really in charge. Um, we tried to get FERC here. You know, people have asked, where's FERC? Um, since they're the, one of the main siting authorities and we couldn't get them in the room. I think we've only got them in the room once in nine years. Uh, we're going to try harder next year because they have some stuff we'd like to talk to them about. Um, one of the things we've heard, uh, we hear it over and over again from the public. Uh, I heard it from Congress. I was grilled the last time I testified to Congress and got a bunch of follow-up questions from Congress too. Is, is there a need for a more meaningful pipeline safety? siting process. Um, so that's kind of what this session was designed to do about, to talk about a little bit. Um, is there a need for more consistency between different types of pipelines and states? Because right now if you're a gas pipeline you have a different siting authority uh, even within whether you cross a state boundary or not. Uh, if you're a liquid pipeline it depends whether you cross an international boundary or a state boundary. Some states have siting authority, some states don't. Um, so there's, a, there's not much consistency there. Um, do we need to reevaluate the whole idea of public necessity? Uh, FERC seems to interpret what public necessity is much different than most of the public does. Um, and is there a need for a new way for citizen and local government involvement? And you heard kind of how the NEB has approached that with, uh, you know, trying to provide some uh, minimal amount of funding for the, those really impacted to be involved in these complicated processes. So that was what we were hoping to talk about. We're going to find out what our speakers are actually going to talk about now. And I'm, I'm happy to introduce um, Robert Goldston, who's with the Princeton Ridge Coalition in New Jersey, and they found a new pipeline coming their direction. And let me find his presentation. Go. Mr. Gold. Okay. Uh, thank you for coming to hear. Uh, I've got a story to tell. It's uh, really a story from one end to the other of what's going on with uh, the siting decisions on pipelines. So we represent only a relatively small piece. Uh, this Princeton Ridge is about 1.3 miles of a Transco Lighty Southeast expansion project. Uh, I'm Rob Goldston. I'm a professor at Princeton, uh, essentially in the physics department. For 12 years, I ran a Department of Energy National Laboratory that had a lot of safety issues and, so I, and a lot of stress analysis and so on. So I've got a lot of experience in this area. Probably most neighborhoods don't have people like that. So let me tell you about what went on. So first, there was the pre-filing period, which was most of 2013. Uh, the Princeton Ridge Coalition, I hadn't joined yet, uh, met with Transco starting in April. Uh, and Transco's position was very simple. The 50-foot right-of-way that went across this wooded area with Jurassic Diabase underneath it, a, kind of an interesting area. It has a uh, uh, hanging uh, uh, water, uh, vernal pools, and so on. Uh, anyway, uh, their position was they're going to widen it from 50 feet to 85 feet and that gas would be left on in the existing pipeline while they put a 42-inch pipeline next to it all across this ridge. And when we asked, uh, when the others asked, what about turning off the gas, they said never. What about less than 85 feet? Well, we might begin to think about that. So then in July, this is when I joined in 15 months ago more or less, um, there was a field visit with FERC, with Mergent, who is the subcontractor writing the EA for FERC, uh, Transco, Williams Transco, I'll just call them Transco here, the Princeton Municipality, and then this Princeton Ridge Coalition. And a lot of things happened. There's notes from this meeting. They have nothing to do with what really counted, which were these two informal comments from FERC in our sort of meeting with Transco. First of all, if you leave the right-of-way at about 50 feet, we won't press you for alternative routes. That was a direct quote, more or less, from the uh, FERC folks. And also they said, we will ask Transco how it plans to work safely with the gas on, given the boulders there in the wetlands. We had shallow, uh, as it turned out, shallow bedrock, boulders, and wetlands all together. Uh, and so what was, what was going to be their safety plan? So those two things came from FERC. Um, so we had to make a submission, of course, during the pre-filing period and we talked about the status of the existing pipeline, how many times had it been damaged, what were the ILI results. We talked about pre-excavation surveys of where there were rocks, where there were wetlands, let's know what's going on here before we walk into it. Uh, what's your safety plan for construction and excavation? Are you gonna do blasting? 
Um, what are you going to do about those rocks that are there? Um, that's actually the next section also. Uh, then what about co post-construction safety testing? What are your plans there? And what about the real alternative that is quite a bit safer and quite a bit environmentally more attractive, uh, horizontal directional drilling? So that was 20 pages of, of input we, we provided. Um, it's interesting. We did a FOIA request. Uh, and uh, so right around that time, uh, FIMSA forwarded our input that we had sent to them uh, to FERC. They say, uh, Mr. Goldston has concerns about the safety aspects of heavy equipment uh, traversing the operating pipeline. Then they have a wonderful little section blacked out there. We have recently sent in our appeal to find out what that section says. Perhaps he says, you know, Mr. Goldston has nice curly hair. I don't know what it says there. And then in the next section, it says, if this route is still an option, FIMSA would request that precautionary measures to address Mr. Goldston's concerns be identified as part of the approval process and the pre-construction process documentation required by FERC. So right on. This is their job, and they're doing it right. This was wonderful. Uh, I didn't know about it, of course, until way later when I FOIA'd it. Um, and then FERC did a data request. And this is, this is just, um, just before the, the actual filing. And they want more detailed discussions of HDD design. They don't buy Transco's reasons that's, that were, it was infeasible. And Transco's reasons were, in fact, silly. Um, it refers to a Transco onshore. They say that the um, submission refers to Transco's onshore pipeline construction manual specs. Um, and provide this manual, please. So this is interesting. This is really important because the CFRs say you must have a manual and you must follow it. So asking for this manual is really important, right on. And then they go specifically address the effect that large rocks in proximity to a pipeline could have on the effectiveness of cathodic protection. This was a big issue that we brought up. They were reflecting it. So far, so good. Uh, then, of course, Transco comes in with their installation procedure. They did give us reducing the increase in the right-of-way because this, this was really outrageous to make this huge gap through this beautiful forest. Uh, I'm not the expert on the environmental issues, but it was very clear that this would be very destructive environmentally. So they stuck with the 50-foot right-of-way. They're going to take a little extra space here and there, but roughly 50 feet. And, and FERC said, we won't force you to consider an alternative if you keep to 50 feet. And so they had heard that, and so there it was. Now they're going to leave the existing 36-inch pipeline operating at the maximum operating pressure of 800 PSI. Then while that thing is under pressure, they're going to remove the surface boulders above existing 36-inch pipeline with a backhoe. So I asked uh, Henkel and McCoy, have you ever dropped a big boulder? There was a lot of silence after that question. Um, and then they're going to install six inches of matting over the existing pipeline. That's a step in the right direction. And then they were going to run a 50-ton rock hammer over the existing pipeline to break up the boulders and the bedrock in the new trench. At one point, we asked them, what about, uh, what about the repeating strain due to, the, due to that vibration? Have you calculated any of that? And they got a lot of silence to that, too. Then they're going to remove the broken rocks. And finally, they were going to run a 61-ton side boom above the existing pipeline to install the new 42-inch pipeline. So this looked to us like a disaster. But FERC then asked the right things. December 2nd, 2013, they wanted to know about geotechnical investigations and ground penetrating radar, things we'd asked for. They wanted to know about the calculations and analysis by Transco on the possible stresses, then how those stresses compared to safety codes. So far, so good. Um, the plans regarding the existing pipeline uh, to continue transmitting natural gas. So they're asking, are you really going to do that? And then finally, they say, how are you going to test the integrity at the end? So, you know, we're really off to a good start. I'll give you a little bit of a spoiler here. Nothing else happened. So we met extensively with Transco. I should say nothing else happened with FIMSA and FERC with these guys, on the docket anyway. So Transco hired some consultants based on those questions to make subsoil measurements. They made multiple measurements. They did them all in August. We'll get back to that. Uh, the bedrock is five feet down over much of the line, so the existing line is three feet. It's supposed to have three feet of cover, one foot underneath of buffer. That adds up to seven feet, but the bedrock is at five feet over much of the area. Probably the pipeline is lying directly on the bedrock when it was put there 55 years ago. There's large boulders over top. That first picture, you may have noticed those boulders. The original guys who built this thing dug the ditch, put the, put the pipeline in there, and then threw the boulders back over top of the pipeline which is now illegal. Uh, 
tra they, got, they hired a consultant, a good group, smart guys, to assess the stresses in the pipeline. They only did five cases of 3D studies. This is a 3D problem, as it took us a while to explain to them. Um, and one of, the com one of the things that came out is the results are extraordinarily sensitive to the soil conditions. Factors of 10 change in the stresses depending on the soil conditions, you assume. So we found serious deficiencies in these analyses. You know, I, my career, I spent a lot of time looking, talking with engineers, making sure they put the right things into these analyses, they read the right things out of them, and that's the key. The, the, these new codes are pretty good at actually doing the calculation, but you have to ask the right question, you have to know how to interpret the answer. Um, so we, provi we provided an eight-page technical analysis of the details of what they had done, and four pages saying that all those great questions that FERC asked had been ignored, one after another after another. Just no answer to them. And so we discussed then with FIMSA, um, how are we going to adjudicate this? Here's a very complex technical work that was done by these consultants, stress uh, engineering analysis, I think, or stress engineering services. Um, good, smart guys. Um, and then here were, uh, you know, this uh, curly-haired Princeton professor who thought that uh, there were problems with this. Um, who's going to adjudicate this? And the answer we got, and I have contemporaneous notes of what I sent out to the other people in the coalition after I spoke with people from FIMSA, was just keep talking to Transco. We at FIMSA don't have the resources to do detailed technical analysis. We can't be that adjudicator. WTF. Who's going, to be the who's going to be the adjudicator? How's that going to work? So let me give you just a few examples of the problem. So the stress analysis did not account for water-saturated soil conditions as specifically requested by FERC, if you read that earlier view graph. What about water saturation? Well, they said there is no water saturation. So Rakesh over there and I went over next to his house, next to the pipeline, uh, and we took a post hole digger. This was really high tech, a manual post hole digger. Once we got 18 inches down, 18 to 20 inches down, it began to fill with water. It would fill actually to about five inches below surface. It was obviously, there was obviously groundwater, like 18 inches below the surface, and the calculations they were doing this with assumed, or you know, based on measurements in August, not in this location, said that groundwater was 16 feet below the surface, and it also said that up at the top was silt. And what silt does when it gets wet is it turns into toothpaste and they didn't have that in their calculations. They also never considered the obvious case, which we began to call to make it clear, between a rock and a hard place. So here is a 61-ton side boom. That turns out to be about the weight of two Sherman tanks, sitting on top of a mat bridge, sitting on top of a boulder. There were lots of boulders above the pipeline. There's no way they could lift a boulder like that up safely above, from above the pipeline. There's the pipeline, there's some gravel maybe, and there's this impermeable basalt salt. Uh, rock, rather, basalt rock. And so this incredibly heavy pipeline is going to push that rock, that incredibly heavy side boom is going to push that rock into that pipe, obviously. Well, they did calculations with the um, basalt rock, and they did calculations with the boulder, and when we asked, how about you put them both together, they said that was logically impossible. Okay, so with their simplified calculations, where they ignored the, worst, the obvious simple worst case calculation, they did a bunch of calculations, and I won't drag you through all of them, but look there under maximum plastic strain. In one of these cases where they use somewhat wet soil, but I'm sorry, somewhat soft soil but not wet soil, the plastic strain, the extension where the dent would be was 4.6%, and the law says 4%. But the text that they have there, they never noticed this. They, they, they only talked about plain dents. They didn't talk about injurious dents, and in particular in this case, they didn't talk um, about dents at the location of the seam welds. They had actually that, that thing in there. In fact, it's a little garbled, so I've corrected their table. But they had indeed the comment, but in the text they never noted that their own calculations violated their comment. So we pointed that out to Transco. And I'll tell you in a moment what they did about that. Um, so now on, uh, on May 6th, they, they submitted another plan. The plan looked just like the old plan, but they told us on May 7th that they were going to change it. But then fi and on, finally on June 2nd, they did a good job. This is Transco, no, as far as we know, input from, from FIMS or FERC. Um, we did, I mean, that would have had to have been on the docket. 
Um, and so their plan was to do everything they were going to do before, uh, evac but they were going to evacuate the gas for three to six weeks, a little ambiguous whether it was going to be for a functional period or a period of time, replace it with water, take the boulders away, assure ground cover, install sort of wooden bridges over the existing pipeline, um, run, a, run the rock hammer only on the new trench, not over the old pipeline because they really couldn't justify that the stre repetitive stresses would be okay, remove the broken rocks, pressure test, hydro test, the existing pipeline to one and a half MAOP for I think it's 12 hours, and return to service. So that was pretty good, but you notice my code is that yellow is bad. So now they were going to still run the 61-ton side boom above the active existing pipeline after they tested the existing pipeline. Now we're going to break it after we tested it. This was good planning. Um, so this was a problem. But, you know, we'd made it halfway maybe. I don't know how you want to count that. And as far as I can tell, without help from the regulators, it was just our beating on them continuously. Um, so our response was 13 pages about the stress analysis and the output on the outage period, five pages on CFR violations. So this is interesting. PHMSA's point of view, we had discussions with them, is that all they can do, the total mandate they have, is to consider CFR violations. Will this project, as de defined, violate the Code of Federal Regulations? Well, so we made the point that the Code of Federal, Federal Regulations says you must have a construction manual, and that construction manual must be followed. And it turns out that uh, they actually, despite saying, no, we won't give you our construction manual, actually their answer to that request for the construction manual, you know, you referenced the construction manual, please give us the construction manual. Their response to that was reference removed. They didn't give them the construction manual, but they did tell us, it turns out, a couple of sentences in the construction manual, enough to reconstruct that they were violating the CFRs with what they were doing because they didn't have adequate stress calculations. Um, that's very important. FIMSA does, through this little detail, have control through the CFRs that these guys are acting right. And if they were to put onto the docket, or even say privately since it could be FOIA'd, if they were to put onto the docket, this project violates NEPA, those four words, I think it would be hard for FERC to build the project. Or at least the third time they did that, it would be hard for FERC to do it. So my take is that FIMSA has all the authority it needs. So, but we thought we'd better keep, better be more respectable, so we brought Richard uh, Kuprowitz on, and he was great. He articulated the advantages of horizontal directional drilling, argued for using water in the existing pipeline even more articulately and more widely than we had thought from before the first rock removal to after the final cover of the new line due to the risk of injurious dents. When you, when you have a dent here, you're probably going to gouge the thing, and gouging plus denting is really not okay. We got letters from the New Jersey senators and from congressmen, including Frank Pallone, who's now going to be the ranking member on the relevant committee, arguing for careful consideration of our safety concerns. We got a similar motion from the Princeton Municipal Council, and we provided seven pages of responses to what I thought were silly arguments about HDD. Now, HDD is a tough project here, because this is Jurassic Diabase. It's very, very hard rock. But it's not a project, it's not necessarily going to fail because it is hard rock, it's not going to collapse. Uh, but they argued there were going to be neat curves, didn't make any sense, and that the length was unprecedented. Well, it was 5% more than the longest previous that was eight years ago. So, you know, if you can't make 5% progress in eight years, you should give up trying to make progress. So then, then the EA was filed by FERC on August 4th, and it recommended a FONSI. It stipulated one thing the Transco should submit a plan to assure that the air gap, there's supposed to be, I think, an eight-inch air gap under this bridge is always present. So that was something. Um, so we came back with 29 pages of analysis, and they actually managed to piss me off at this point. Um, they, <laughs> being frank about how I felt, um, they made incorrect conclusions based on incorrect analyses. So how did they cure the problem that they were stressing the pipe too much in their calculation? They said, well, previously we, we doubled the weight of the pipe layer, to, and, and in fact you read the text and it says we doubled the weight of the pipe layer because it's going to be on, on hillsides, it's going to be unbalanced from one side to the other, so for safety we double the weight. Very reasonable thing to do. But they said, let's not double the weight, let's take the weight straight as is, let's assume both le re the tracks of the pipe layer get exactly equal weight. Um, well, they ignored the 10 tons of the thing the pipe layer lifts, and they ignored the fact that the way you work a pipe layer, I talked to people in my lab and I read a lot of stuff about this, is the first thing you do is you extend the counterweight over to one side and you put all your weight on that track. 
80% roughly of your weight on that track, and then you lift this other thing and you come back more to center. So in fact, on every lift, they would violate the assumptions that they were making in these calculations. Like, do they not know that? Uh, did they think it's just that I'm too stupid, I won't figure it out? Um, this idea of, of making sure that there's air under the bridge, well, it turned out they had done calculations that were equivalent to not having air under the bridge. It was an 8% effect. We're looking at things that are horrendously more than 8%, so it's an 8% cure for a factor of two problem. Well, it's better than no cure, but it's only an 8% cure. Um, we did not have anybody other than, you know, me and a couple of engineers I consulted um, about doing engineering analysis. But that wasn't actually what pissed me off. What pissed me off were these two. Here we had this wonderful, I showed you this December 2nd and August 29th data requests from FERC, right spot on, just the right questions. Maybe we would have added one or two more, phrased them a little differently, but they're basically spot on. Um, they didn't even check that Transco hadn't answered the questions. I mean, what responsibility do you have in the EA? It seems obvious that's a responsibility. Um, I won't rep repeat my three-letter acronym. They also had findings, and every time they had a finding on something, they only quoted what the industry said. They didn't quote the opposite, or you know, whatever we had said, or whatever anybody had said. So, for example, they say, um, they say, uh, they c this one blew me away. We have consulted with the Princeton Ridge. They have, uh, rather, Transco has consulted with the Princeton Ridge Coalition. Full stop. The whole finding, it doesn't say somewhere, and the, and the Princeton Ridge Coalition is pissed off as hell, right? It didn't say that. I mean, what it, I mean, this is the most biased thing you can imagine. There were eight of them, biased, one after another. Just not okay. You're trying to do an honest assessment of really what's going on, come to an honest conclusion. You have to present both sides and then say this side is right. And you know, we could be wrong. I, frankly, I've been wrong a few times as a scientist, maybe a lot of times. But you have to argue it. You have to come up with why. And they never did. Um, finally, we had a whole list of issues brought up, especially by Richard, that were just not discussed. They didn't even mention the stuff from Acufax. So we came up with some more responses. We said, uh, we, had, we asked Rick again to work on this, and he uh, explained that this bridge is not a good solution. Uh, originally, he was going to call them Texas Gophers, you know, these sort of ridges of dirt going along to hold it up the extra eight inches. And he didn't think that was going to do anything but provide the illusion of safety. And he reiterated what he had said. We asked Carolyn Elephant, a lawyer who I guess is not here, uh, to present the legal deficiencies in their arguments, such as, in particular, the lack of response to, to Rick's input. Uh, we also got a congressional letter, and I think this was an interesting twist, uh, from the senators and our congressmen, asking for a meeting, thank you very much, between the Princeton Ridge Co Coalition, Transco, FERC, and PHMSA. Let's get all the players in a room, and let's resolve the issues. So that FIMSA and, Tr FIMSA and Transco had to hear us and had to hear our arguments with, with um, sorry, FIMS, uh, FIMSA and FERC had to hear us and had to hear our discussions with Transco. And then we had a final discussion with Transco. We, got, we had a little more chatting, and, and I said, well, let's just have a technical discussion. You know, just you know, enough of this sort of political, what's the plan kind of, let's have a technical discussion. Why don't you talk with your consultants about whether they really did the between a rock and a hard place case, because you seem to think they did that case. And my understanding is they didn't do that case. So why don't you just, just double check with them about that paragraph where they say that it's inconceivable you could do that case. And while you're at it, why don't you ask them if groundwater 20 inches below the surface would be a material difference uh, consistent with their seven different places. They said if there's a material difference, you shouldn't trust our results, difference in the, in the soil conditions. So miraculously, um, there was a new proposal from, from Transco. I mean, really miraculously. I don't know how this happened. They evacuated the gas and they replaced with water as their plan, then do everything they were planning to do before, and then at the very end, pressure test the existing pipeline and return to service. This is exactly what Rick Cooperwitz asked for. It was contingent on extending work hours. Uh, we've got a motion submitted to the municipality to go ahead and do that. We still think that the safest approach would be horizontal directional drilling under the ridge, but you know, the, let's, let's be sure that they can do this. Um, so our assessment is we have no idea why Transco changed tack after the environmental assessment. The environmental assessment comes out, recommends a FONSI, and they change their plan. Is it because we heard that uh, they heard that we were thinking about legal issues? Was it this congressional request for meeting with FERC? 
was that they went to their consultant and the consultant said, in light of the other two things, it's not going to work out too well for you, so you better change your plan. We just don't know. What we do know is this process, and I'm going to be frank here, is deeply flawed. And bizarrely, it was just fine through 2013. FERC and FIMSA did a great job, I'll go a bit stronger than what I say there, a great job responding to our concerns up through the end of 2013. And then something changed. They just disengaged. Um, the environmental assessment, in my opinion, had serious material shortcomings. I had nastier words earlier, but uh, Barbara Blumenthal, who's head of the Princeton Ridge Coalition, suggested I be more tied to what I had said earlier, and it's what I, f it's, this is true. Um, we did much of PHMSA's job for them, in my opinion. They don't apparently have the resources, they don't feel they have the mandate, but they do have the mandate, and most communities don't have our resources, so I think this is a real problem. So thank you.